Last week, we went over the gods, the Aesir. And this week, we're going to go in the Prosetta over the goddesses. In the tale of Sigurd and Brunhild, in the tale of Frey and Gerda, in the tale of Odin and Frigg, in all of these tales of the great relationships, there, and all three of the generational aspects of the great grandmother and father, the grandmother and the father, and the mother and the father of the Riggs Thula, you find when a man and a woman get together, there is a, a flowering of the couple to become something more. They raise children that are benefits, that are cornerstones to the foundation of society. For a long time, Ossetru was a bunch of hairy-legged men talking about the Vikings and rising up and we're going to support the cause and all kinds of things other than holding these ideas of the divine holy. Very, very rarely were the Aesir a part of that. The second book I wrote was on the divine feminine in Ossetru. I got the idea from a book um, called Living, Laying with the Heavenly Woman. And it was about a man's ability to incorporate the feminine aspects into doing what he is. But I, I digress. Let's, let's continue on here. Then said Gangleri, which are the Asenir? Har, which means high, said Frigg is the foremost. She has that estate, which is called Fensalir, and it is most glorious. Fensalir is the Fens Hall, the hall in the Fens. The second is Saga. She dwells at Sogvabeker, and that is a great abode. The third is Ire. She is the best physician. The fourth is Gethin. She is a virgin. As you can tell, he says that they are not less holy than the Asenir, but they don't really go into what they are, what they do, who they, he's kind of glossing over it. So anytime you look at the role a woman must play in this, in, in the, in Ossetry, in, in life, we, we got to look at when the book we're referencing was written. If you're looking at most of the 19th and 20th century, early 20th century books, there's an overlying Victorian mentality that seeks to keep a woman in her place. There is no important aspect to what the feminine might bring. But in this day and age, the woman was a very, very valuable part of the tribe and the community from every stage of a man's life, there was a woman involved. His birth, his early tutelage, how he was raised, how he was taught to act was largely the responsibility of the wife and the mother. Uh, as a wife to another man, as the woman who took care of the home, who raised these children, who taught these children, um, to a man, when he died, he was prepared for death by a woman. And when he did die, he was escorted into whatever afterlife he might go to, also by a woman, be it hell or Valkyries or whatever, to the halls of his ancestors. So when we look at that, we look at the roles that men played. They were the chieftain and they were the Gothies and they were the great warriors. They were sacrificed. They, they were sacrificial. That tribe could do without those men. They could die in combat. They could fall away. But to lose a mother from your tribe, that's a bad thing. They had a foundation. Women could help property, all this stuff. So when we look at what they mean, we see a man writing about this. And this is as alien a language to him as a Martian would speak to us. He might be the presiding judge of the all thing. But the understanding of what that role a woman plays is, is very difficult to comprehend. As we go through these list of goddesses, we're going to see that each one has a dynamic opposite among the Aesir. There is one that's left out, though, and that is Tyr's partner, Tiwaz, the deuce praetor, the North Star. Her name is Zisa. She was a continental goddess. And uh, uh, in September, on September 28th, the city of Augsburg used to hold a great festival and celebration. They made offering and sacrifice and prayers uh, to Zisa, and she granted them a victory over the Romans. Her symbol was a light uh, warship, one of the boats that could travel up and down the rivers. Uh, there's a great deal we could learn her if we look hard. There's a couple of temples and statues and stuff before. That's Tears. That's, that's his, 
for spawning aspects. Let's read here a little bit, but first, Frigg is the foremost. Much of what we know about Frigg comes from what Odin says about her. Odin says that she knows all things. She knows every bit as much as he does. She knows the futures and the, and the well-being of men, but she speaks it not. And that's an interesting point. Every grandmother, every mother, every sister, more often than not, they're going to know what their brother or their son is going to do before he even does it. And when you escalate that to a divine level, you begin to understand. I can tell them all day long, you're making a mistake. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to listen. It doesn't mitigate the value of what she knows and understands. So Frigg is the foremost. Saga is an interesting character. She has that great abode down by the shore. Saga is where Odin goes every day and drinks from golden cups and they talk about the past. It's possible she's a daughter of, of Frigg in some way, but we, it doesn't really ever clarify. That. There are two books of the Codex Regis that were left out when the Bishop Olaf, I think it was, gave it to the King of Denmark. What knowledge might be contained in those two books? Perhaps it goes to this. A lot of what he's writing here is referenced from a book we're not sure what it is, some other record somewhere. The fourth is Gethin, she is a virgin, and they that die maidens attend her. Or the third is Ire, she is the best physician, the goddess of healing. Why only one line would be, would be given to a, a goddess that is probably vitally important to your success on the battlefield, to the health of your community, I don't know. Why would that only be only be that much? We'll get into it. Now the fourth is Gethin. She is a virgin. They that die maidens attend her. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the Prosetta, it's Gethin that starts all this off. And there is a celestial aspect to that that a lot of people kind of miss. When Gethin goes to the north, the North Star, and gets her four sons come back to plow the amount of land in one day and one night. Not just one day, but one day and one night, full 24 hours. In those days, the Big Dipper was known as the plow. It rotated around the North Star in one day and one night. The four stars that represent the bull are the four oxen. Now, there are four other stars in the handle. The very end star is actually two, and they are known as the, the bride and the groom. So in that one constellation that's, that's visible all over the Northern Hemisphere, you have an interesting dynamic that Gethian seems to control this. She has produced a thought process that results in a, a true nautical standard. She goes to the North, produces those four suns, and plows away that amount of land, in one day and one night. If we delve into that celestial aspect of the beginning of the tale and use it throughout the rest of the Prosetta, we begin to see that all of these minor instances where as above, so below happens to occur from the smallest cellular level and the waves of energy to the earth and each individual, how we relate to each other, to the dynamics between man and woman, to how the solar system rotates and the universe operates. You will see that same pattern continue on throughout. So I think it behooves us to look through this Prosetta with the idea that there may also be a celestial aspect. Huh. Don't see biplanes very often. Gethian is the one that started all this. And that true North Star is where she went to get the four oxen to help her plow a piece of land. Maybe we should be looking at that when we read this Prosetta. Are we using an August thought process that results in a true nautical standard that will allow us to carve away a life for ourselves worth living, which is really valuable, which is really worth something? When we approach ideas of faith, We've got to have a reasonable expectation of some kind of success. And it may be something as simple as, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to have to deal with these ideas of loss that are crippling me. I want to do better in life. When we spend our time trying to determine 
how well that effort is going based upon how well we can quote an academic book, we're really missing the point. And it's interesting that these ace and year are the ones that point us in that direction. The fifth is Fulla. She also is a maid and goes with loose tresses and a golden band about her head. She bears the ashen coffer of Frigg and has charge over her footgear and knows her secret counsel. When Balder and Nana take up their high seat in hell, Nana sends back for Fulla a finger ring. And I've always contended that when a young lady uh, is facing the ideas of womanhood, it's a daunting task. Will I be a good enough wife? Will my man love me? Can I be a good mother? There's a world of doubt that goes with a little girl becoming a woman because at a certain age, she doesn't have a choice. She's going to go through a biological process that physically makes her a woman. One of the strongest sources of counsel for these young girls is a big sister. And when a big sister takes that long journey with her husband and goes to a different realm and is far away from her and she still has those doubts, the idea that her big sister would love her enough to send her that token, that ring, to reassure her that it's going to be okay, I think is one of the more beautiful things that comes out with the relationship between sisters something that I think our faith should cultivate amongst the women in this, in what we call also true today. And it's oftentimes overlooked. I think part of this is that we will no longer overlook it. Freya is most gently born together with Frigg. She is wedded to the name Odor, a man named Odor. Their daughter is Nos. She is so fair that those things which are fair and precious are called Nossi. Odor went away on long journeys, and Freya weeps for him, and her tears are red gold. Freya has many names, and this is the cause thereof. That she gave herself sundry names when she went out among unknown peoples, seeking Odor. She is called Mardol and Horn, Geffen, Geffen, Sire, and Freya had the necklace Brisingam. She is also called the Lady of the Vanir. Every aspect of the development of the gods into a tribe of individuals who have built themselves into something better than they were. They've all had to make a sacrifice. They've all had to deal with some kind of loss. They've had to re unlearn and relearn new things. They've had to lose loved ones. They've had to grow through pain. They've had to sacrifice something to become something more. For the goddess of love and abundance, her sacrifice is the loss of a man. In a day and age when men might go a Viking, when they might simply go hunting, and who knows for 10,000 years before that, when they might simply die of lost in the woods or eaten by wolves, it was a very real fear that a woman might lose her husband, that she might spend the rest of her time looking for that partner. And with Freya, we have this very powerful, beautiful image of a woman who never gave up and who raised two, not one, but two very beautiful daughters whose names literally mean treasure. But there's still pain. Her tears are of red gold. But the important thing to see about all of this is that it does not stop her from lending aid and support to those champions who worship her, such as Otter. She doesn't do it by picking him up and doing it for himself. She does it by escorting him along the way, calling upon a sister and cutting a wolf loose on his ass so he'll pick up the pace to become what he's supposed to become. There's a, uh, there's a powerful lesson there for many women of today who find themselves alone, trying to raise a child, uh, walking through, looking for love, probably in all the wrong places, so on and so forth, that they do have what it takes, that there is something divine on their side to help them make it through those tough times when their tears are red as gold. The Brisingham and Jim represents the fires of the inspiration of human intellect. Now she is supposed to have lain with seven dwarves. Who knows what that really was about, but there's always been an attempt to humanize that and kind of discredit the validity of Freya as a goddess of love and abundance and make her seem like a woman of loose moral or loose character. But from those basic and simple individuals, the dwarves, the not fully developed individuals that worm their way through the body of the mirror, she pulls out the fires of inspiration for the human mind. 
what greater place for the fires of inspiration to reside than around the neck of the goddess of love and abundance and being the good mother. Few things inspire men to great courses of action than love. Few things inspire men to, they have raised empires, they have started wars, they have separated from their families, they have done all kinds of crazy things. Those fires of inspiration reside around the goddess of love. That's the Brisingaman. She is the lady of the Vanir. The seventh is Yothan. She is most diligent in turning the thoughts of men to love, both of women and of men. And from her name, love longing is called Yothan. When a man spends his time as a warrior and an adventurer, it's very difficult to make that transition from a warrior ready to attack and beat and defend and violence and all this other stuff. At some point, he's got to make a transition. It is a stage of life for a man. We see this best exemplified when Frey sacrifices that very powerful phallic symbol of the sword to his partner so he might go and secure for him the hand of Gerda. He makes that transition from warrior to that husband. He has the skills of the warrior to secure the boundaries of his home so Gerda might become who she's supposed to become. But sometimes that's a difficult process to make. No one teaches you how to turn that switch off. No one teaches you how to not be hyper-aggressive. No one teaches you that it's safe to not be that way. How do you turn someone's thoughts to love? We have a goddess for men and of women. And perhaps in another aspect of it, we can look at it as a goddess of compassion. We can spend most of our time in this world thinking about how much we hate this person or hate that person, or we might boost our egos by diligently rooting out their character defects uh, for all the world to see so we might feel better about ourselves. But how do we turn that into something when we show compassion, we change everything. Because the first person that benefits from that act of caring for someone, like we see Freya do with um, the giantess under the rock when she goes to see, uh, when she takes Otter to visit Odin and Thor. And I cannot remember her name. She reaches out to a woman that's in a bad state of, a bad state of existence. She's literally living under a rock, this giantess, this female who has done nothing to develop the best aspects of who and what she is. She's not in an environment where she might be able to do so. She knows all of this history and all of this intellectual stuff, but she's nowhere near a place where she might feel safe to express the beauty of who she is. Yet Freya reaches out to her as a sister. And this goddess here kind of represents all of those aspects of what it means for a woman to reach out and help another woman take a step forward. So she is a goddess that, that turned the thoughts of men to love, both of women and of men. And from her name, love longing is called. The eighth is Lofi. And I'm probably butchering these and, you know, it's, I'll get it right someday. She is so gracious and kindly to those that call upon her that she wins all fathers or Frigg's permission for the coming together of mankind in marriage, of women and of men though it were forbidden before or seemed flatly denied. From her name, such permission is called leave, and thus also she is much loved of men. Sometimes men fall in love with women that are way out of their league. How does the average man reach out to that beautiful woman that stirs his heart? Who would he call upon? In the Alba Small, we find that Thor says, I alone am God of marriage. So her counterpart in this idea of marriage is Thor. But to get to that point, there's another goddess that helps kind of inspire men to well, become something more. Because she's going to seek permission from the Allfather or Frigg, meaning they are equal in this, in this capacity. The coming together of mankind in marriage of women and of men, though it were forbidden before. If it's forbidden, it's because somebody doesn't measure up. There's no suitable benefit to be had by either party because of this union of marriage. In those days, there were many contracts that were involved. There, were, there was uh, monies paid by the husband. There were monies paid by the father-in-law. There were 
monies set aside for the security of the wife should they have, uh, should she seek uh, the right of divorce. But to get to that point, to have that kind of abundance, to build yourself into something worthy of notice by someone that you want to love, takes a lot of effort. Sometimes the greatest reassurance we might have that we got this, we can do this, that I'm worth it. But we might find that wisdom, we might find that strength amongst the ace and your the warder of men is the god of marriage, but there's a goddess here that helps people who are not ready. I think that's also a very beautiful thing. The ninth is Var. She hearkens to the oaths and compacts made between men and women. Wherefore, such covenants are called vows. She also takes vengeance on those who perjure themselves. So all these goddesses are dedicated to this marital aspect of creating that good home where individuals might flourish. So I promise you, if your home is not in the order that it needs to be, and you go off the front door to go to work, and your mind is wrapped around whatever nonsense is going on back home, or something's not healthy, or something is sick, or there's no happiness in the home, or you dread going back in that front door, it's going to be very hard to enjoy the success that we ought to be expecting living this awesome true life. So obviously there's going to be a goddess there that says you need to measure up to the standard. You made an oath and a compact. There's a covenant there. And you need to do the right thing to begin with, to be worthy of all of these goddesses' attention, support, effort on your behalf to become something more, to make this transition. Because throughout our lives, we continue to make transitions. So there's kind of a threat. There. Now, a lot of people want to use her when they talk about the oaths that we take to organizations or groups or some of these other ideas that more often than not are really subtle forms of manipulation uh, to ensure once you have an oath, well, there's really not really imp much impetus to continue to develop and become more I've got the oath. They better not break it. Bar's going to, she's going to take care of that. But it says right there, it's compacts made between men and women. Wherefore, such covenants are called vows. She also takes mention of those who perjure themselves. To perjure yourself lends itself to the idea that in a court of law, if an individual tells a lie under an oath, they're violating something that's very special. When Forseti, the son of Balder and Nana, offers that sound judgment, that equal and fair judgment that none may gainsay, he is creating or helping to maintain a cornerstone of society in that free men have a legitimate expectation or right to think that we can operate in a free society. The cornerstone of that is justice. It's no accident that our gods have this divine aspect to it. Bar is a great part of it. The tenth is Vor. She is wise and of searching spirit, so that none can conceal anything from her. It is a saying that a woman becomes aware of that which she is informed. Woman's intuition. This is the wise, the searching spirit. This is the... I know a couple of women that kind of exemplify this. They are the women that are aware of what's going on around them. Uh, some people refer to it as women's intuition. But some women have learned the ability to slow down and pay attention, and they can kind of pick up on what other people are feeling or sometimes thinking or how they're going to act. There's a goddess that governs it. It was such an important aspect of the community, the wise old woman who could give love to somebody even though they're fixing to really step on their crank. It's an important aspect. It's also a component of compassion. But you're not going to lie to grandma. Grandma's going to know, and she's probably going to bust your ass. Um, the 11th is seen. She keeps the door in the hall and locks it before those who should not go in. She is also set at trials as a defense against suits as she wishes to refute. This is the re expression that sign is set forward when a man denies. <laughs> Once again, we have in the marriage ceremony when the keys are exchanged for the sword, um, 
the man creates the environment where the woman might become everything and express the beauty of who she is. That's what we're doing here. When we build a home, we're creating a safe environment where our children might flourish, where our wives might express who they are. And a lot of times men get confused about that. They, they think it should go a certain way they think it should. Well, um, there's a difference between a man and a woman. And what she uses to express the beauty of who she is might be something he can't begin to comprehend any more than she can comprehend when he beats a man into a pulp for sport. There's a big difference there. The sign is the door in the hall. She locks it before those who should not go in. That's the mother at the door saying, you're not going to come in and harm my children. You're not going to do this or this is my home. And at that door, that last line of defense will be that woman, will be that mother protecting her child. And there are a few things more dangerous than a woman protecting her child. She is also said at trials as a defense against such suits as she wishes to refute. This is the expression that signs set forward when a man denies. Once again, one of the cornerstones of a free of a society of free men is an aspect of justice. So now we have Balder, whose home has the fewest of banquet rooms, whose judgment none may gainsay. We have Forseti, who gives the best judgments that all men might feel it's equal and we have now another goddess who will stand up and defend against those suits she wished to refute we have a masculine and feminine component dynamic or aspect to the very idea of justice in a free society what an amazing idea from the dana law to the magna carta to the u.s constitution and bill of rights we have these ideas of freedom come forward and they originate right here in our prosetta. What else do you think might originate, help us build a powerful society or become competent, capable individuals might be hidden in, these, in this old tale? Well, so far, I've found quite a bit of it that helps me become something more. The twelfth is lean. She is established as keeper over those men whom Frigg desires to protect from any danger. Hence comes the saying that he who escapes lean, he who escapes leans. So Frigg has got another goddess that's dedicated to protecting, looking over those individuals she favors. That man who makes that transition from warrior to the lover who becomes the dedicated father who raises his beautiful daughters and his children who becomes that capable individual worthy of being married to a woman who may be out of his league. There's a goddess there to help a man deal with that. Not a god, but a goddess. I suppose Frey would be the uh, corresponding masculine aspect of that as he never caused a woman to shed a tear. There's something to be said for that, to be a man who is good enough, honest enough, has enough courage to be straightforward with a woman and be honest with her and value what she spent so long trying to protect. The whole idea of Brunhild wrapped in that armor is that she's encased in something that protects the beauty of who she is. As soon as a man has the courage, as in Sigurd, to walk through the fire that surrounds it, to deal with all of the things that a woman puts in the way and take off that helm of fear and recognize her for a woman, when he cuts away that Bernie and frees her from that wall around the beauty of who she is, <coughs> ancient wisdom is imparted between the couple. They sit and they share a memory drop. That same scenario occurs throughout the Rigs Thula where the sons of the three generational parents, two ravens, sit on the side of the bed and discuss what's fixing to happen. This is, um, there's a goddess that looks over all of them. And if they got, yeah, the lean part, I'll have to get into later. But there's, Snotra is 13th. She is prudent and of gentle bearing. And from her name, a woman or a man who is moderate is called Snotra. That graciousness, that stability of noble women 
as a goddess. She is 13. She is prudent and gentle bearing. There's no need to be large and in charge or take care of, take charge of everything because the man won't do it. And that's a lot of times a woman's uh, instinct. Nobody's going to take care of me. I can't rely on anybody. I'll just take care of it myself. I'll handle all of this. And you can usually tell who those women care for by the hunted look upon their face. But there's a goddess here that encourages women to relax, be prudent and gentle bearing, and it'll be okay. The 14th is Pna. Her frig sends on diverse lands on her errands, and she has that horse which runs over sky and sea and is called Hoof Tosser. Once when she was riding, certain of the Vanir saw her course in the air, and then one spake, What flieth there? What fareth there or glideth in the air? She made answer, I fly not though I fare. And in the air glide, on hoof topper, him that Hamskipir got with Godropa. The lineage of the horse is important as her ability to glide in the air. It was the teamwork, literally the horse. Once again becomes important, not only for men, but also for the goddess who Frigg would send on diverse errands. Odin has lent Sleipnir to a couple of individuals. But Frigg has one dedicated to her, Hoof Tosser. From Na's name, that which Schwartz High is said to know. Soul and Bill are reckoned among the Aesir, but their nature has been told before. Now, there are others whose office it is to serve in Valhau, to bear drink and mind the table service and ale plans, and thus they are named in grim and small. Um, let's see here, there's a footnote here that I want to check on. If I can control this thing. From Nal's name, that which source high is said to Nafa. That means to project, to be imminent, to tower over. That's, that's a pretty important thing there. But the uh, Valkyrie's name. My gosh, I'm glad you guys can read that. So I don't think I have to pronounce them all. Price to miss, I would have bear the horn to me. Skegjold and Skogul, Hildur and Thrudir, Lock and Hurfjotr, Gull and Geriod, Rangrinder and Rograinder, Reganleaf, these bear the iron her Yara ale. These are called Valkyries. Them Odin sends to every battle. They determine men's fairness and award victory. Guder and Rota and the youngest Norn, who, who she is called Skull, ride ever to take the slain and decide fights. Yord, the mother of Thor, and Render Valley's mother are reckoned among the Ace and Year. And in that little paragraph, there's an amazing amount of information. The Valkyries that Odin sends to every battle. They help determine men's fairness and award victory. So not only are they out there just collecting the souls, feasting upon the dead, they're determining who's going to win. They're making decisions about the success of battle. All of a sudden, there's a feminine aspect to how successful a man is going to be on the battlefield. Away from Uller, away from Tyr, there's an aspect of Zisa involved in this. They determine men's fairness and award victory. And there are a lot of tales that say that the original ideas of the Valkyrie were hideous uh, women feasting on these old corpses on the battlefield. And then as we get into Wagner and uh, and the, uh, his great tales, they become these great, beautiful women that ride on winged horses. Who knows where the transition really was? Who knows what they really looked like? I'm sure there's a lot of educated ideas about it all. But the fact of the matter is, if you lived in those times, in that day and age, and your man, you had to go fight for a king in some faraway land, and you might die, how are you going to convince someone to do that? How are you going to convince someone to walk away from everything he loves to fight a war or something on someone else's behalf that may not necessarily benefit you at all? Well, there's always the idea of gold and treasure, rape, loot, and pillage. That'll help, but you're still going to, if you die, you die, then what? The Valkyries are that feminine aspect that escort men into the next realm, um, be it uh, Folkvanger, Vingo, or Valhalla. These are what they call the champions. The half go to Freya, she gets the first half. And the second half go to Odin in two different halls. 
Ruder and Rhoda and the youngest Norn, she who is called Skull, tried ever to take the slain in the side fights. The Norns are an interesting, very interesting idea. I could probably devote a whole show to them. Usually the youngest one, Skull, is the maiden. She stands in the future with the empty plate. That leaves everyone we would like to think that it's predetermined. We can go about our lives and do what we will. Um, our fate's determined and so on and so forth. But that kind of thought process doesn't lead us to want to try anything. If fate's hammered out and determined, and that seems to me like the battle cry of the mediocre. The empty plate of skull is yet to be filled. It will be filled with the fruits of our efforts. What we decide to do, what we decide to become, the effort we decide to put forth into this life, into making that sacrifice that keeps us stuck in place, to get rid of those aspects of our being that keep us from moving forward, the results of that action will fill that empty plate of skull for our future. What we put in that plate as offering is very much our responsibility. And here we're told she rides with the Valkyries to determine men's fairness and award victory. The one that's going to be awarded victory is the one that is trained, that is dedicated, that has worked hard, that is trained an hour longer every day than his opponent. He's the one that's going to win. He's going to fill that plate of his future with victory because he's continued to work for it. And it's like that with every aspect of our lives. We want to be successful in business. We want to fill that plate with the benefits of being a well-rounded individual, of being a successful individual and having happy children. That's our responsibility to not get tied up in some political idea over here. That's our responsibility to let go of the ideas of resentment and anger and hate and all those negative emotions or being a victim. Uh, no victim will ever fill a plate with a bountiful future. They'll always be waiting on someone out there to pay attention to them so they might feel important. There's a real, so when we find out that the youngest Norn, the one that holds the pl empty plate for our future, rides to battle to award victory, there's an important lesson we can all learn from that. Now, Yord, the mother of Thor. Yord is the earth. And Odin being the great sky god, that union of earth and sky produced Thor, the warder of men, the lightning, the one who possesses the hammer, the destroyer and the creator. It destroys our enemies, the warder of men. He protects us from those giants, those base human, those base aspects, ideas, concepts of simple human emotions that keep us from filling our plate as we should. He is the warder of men. All great and good things come from this, this earth. All the gold, everything that we look at that's been made, the wooden fence, that barn, that building, that cot, everything came from something we took out of the earth. And all of it, all of it was an idea in a man's mind at some point. Somebody had an idea, they sketched it out on a napkin in a bar, or they sat down at the computer and come up with an idea, and then they got the materials from the earth to build it and create the future that they want for themselves. Every, they mine the copper and the lithium and all of these things, they come out of the earth. Walk down the city street anytime, the asphalt, the concrete, the glass, all of that material came from the earth and all of it was put together because some man had an idea to build a future for himself. Think about the possibility that that creates for us. If you change your thoughts, you change your reality. If you have an idea and you realize where the materials come from, now all of a sudden your becomes a much more important goddess than we typically give her credit for. The cold, the, the breathing, the cold and the winter and the summer, all of these changes of the seasons, there's a real powerful idea encapsulated in Yord that we really miss the point of. Or every time man has, well, I'll put it to you this way. Whenever an ancient tribe or culture went into an area, 
they, they integrated themselves spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally in the environment in which they lived. They became a part of the environment. If they didn't, they wouldn't enjoy any success in hunting. They wouldn't enjoy any success with fishing. They wouldn't understand how when the deer move, when the fish come in to feed, when to harvest the wild berries, they wouldn't understand the flows of energy. But once they became a part of the environment in which they lived, once they integrated themselves into the good graces of Yord herself and began to understand these flows of energy and life, then they would know when they could eat and when they could not eat. That's shit off the train of thought. Isn't that great? That's the benefit of, of your of becoming this becoming aware of of how we integrate ourselves into the environment in which we live. If you look over the earth, there are ancient pyramids, there are ancient civilizations, there are abandoned great huge cities that are empty void of people that have stopped moving forward in time. Every time man has decided to go with his own thought process instead of incorporating it into the environment in which he lives, that city has fallen. The world is populated, it is littered, the landscape of the earth is covered in ancient cities that became so great and grand in a man's eye and were no longer a part of the environment in which they lived, and they failed. Every single one of them. It's happening now in Detroit, isn't it? Flint, Michigan can no longer give itself its own water. Every time man separates himself from the environment he's in, separates himself from the earth, loses his connection to an understanding of the flows of energy around this world, his ability to feed himself becomes dependent upon something other than himself. Our comfort, everything we do, the electricity, our water, our gas, all of it comes from somewhere else. We have separated ourselves from the world that we live in. Now the responsibility for our well-being is not our own. How can we fill the plate of our future when we're relying on someone else to take care of our basic needs? There's a real challenge there. Hopefully... It is an awakening. Rinder, Valley's mother, are reckoned among the Asian year. Rinder is the woman, or the is the is the goddess that Odin either wooed or raved, depending on who you want to talk to. If they say that she was assaulted, it's usually because they're trying to humanize the divine aspect of Odin into terms they can relate with. But very often, when we see people do that, they're trying to humanize it because they cannot understand the interaction of the divine with each other. But this God Valley is the one that takes vengeance. In a day, he grows to a man and takes vengeance and kills Blind Hoder for the killing of Bald. And Render joins the Ace and she's counted among the Ace and the mother of the Avenger. So there's... A certain man was called a gamer and his wife Arboda. She was of the stock of the hill giants, and their daughter was Gerda, who was fairest of all women. It chanced one day that Frey had gone to Hlidskjalf and gazed over all the world, but when he looked over into the northern region, he saw an estate, a house great and fair, and towards this house went a woman. And when she raised her hands and opened the door before her, brightness gleamed from her hands, both over sky and sea all the worlds were illumined with her. Thus his overweening pride in having presumed to sit in that holy seat was avenged upon him, and that he went away full of sorrow. And then when he had come home, he spake not, he slept not, he drank not. No man dared speak to him. Then Niord summoned to him Skirner, Frey's foot page, and bade him go to Frey and beg speech of him, as for whose sake he was so bitter that he would not speak with men. Skirner said he would go, albeit unwillingly, and said that evil answers were to be expected of Frey. Frey was this beautiful aspect, shining, almost solar deity, the foundation of abundance and spring rains, peace and prosperity for men, the Lord of Alphon. Light emanated from him of its own accord. For him to go dark 
would be a very troubling thing indeed, especially for Nior, this god of the sea, where great abundance that rivals your originals. Now, when they talk about Gerda raising her hands and brightness gleamed over sky and sea, they're talking about the northern lights. So what we're looking at here in natural phenomena, we're looking at this union of the midnight sun and the northern lights be a very difficult thing to achieve, wouldn't it? So this tale I've gone over before in the, in the Poetic Edda, but I think it's, it's worthy of repeating because it demonstrates some of these things about which I just talked. Here is a God who cannot seem to figure out how to get this relationship. So there is a goddess for that. Dolphin, Yalton, she is most diligent during the thoughts of men to love, and from her name, love longing is called Siafi. There's the one that is in charge of this love sickness that the, northern, the midnight sun has for the northern lights. Now, Lofen is the one that's going to gain permission. They were forbidden or politely denied. So there's two goddesses that are involved in this aspect. We don't see them necessarily per se, but this is exactly what they're talking about. When he came to pray straight, now, there's another thing to consider, and that Frey sat on this throne that it was Odin. Odin made a number of great sacrifices to obtain that throne. He got rid of that ruinous idea of ego that caused him to lash out the Vanir and got his butt whooped. He sacrificed an eye at the well of Mimir to, to know all things in the same way that Heimdall sacrificed an ear to see all things. The Gallowhorn might also mean ear. Um, he sacrificed some things to earn the right to sit in that seat. And this bright, shining, young adventurer, like many men, they get a glance of the beauty that might be in front of them, and it overwhelms them. Young men often get a glimpse of something wonderful early in their life, or they don't. And sometimes when they get older, they're reminded of that beauty they saw as a young man and how they failed to achieve it. And then we see them have midlife crisis. It is that old crone reminding them of the young maiden that held the empty plate that they failed to fill. Once again, the divine feminine with a powerful, controlling demonstration of, of what they're really worth in this world to the success of men. Frey must make a sacrifice, too, to earn the right to rule Gerda. Frey answered and said that he had seen a fair woman, and for her sake he was so full of grief that he would not live long if he were not to obtain her. It's kind of dramatic, but such is to be expected for the pretty man. And now shalt thou go and woo her on my behalf and have her hither. Whether her father will or no, I will reward thee well for it. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Skinner answered thus, he would go on his errand, but Frey should give him his own sword, which is so good that it fights all of itself. Frey did not refuse, but gave him the sword. And there comes a time when a man loves a woman that he will give up that thing which he thinks makes him who he is to steal his beating heart. Sometimes it's a painful process. Sometimes it's a great process of growth. Then Skirner went forth and wooed the women on him and received her promise. And nine nights later, she was to come to the place called Barry and then go to the bridal with Frey. But when Skirner told Frey his answer, then he sang this lay, long as one night and long as the second. How can I wait through three? Often a month to me seemed less than this one night of wait. And this was to blame for, weapon being, for Frey being so weaponless when he fought Belly and slew him with a great horn of a heart. Now that, and when I wrote Life and the Love of Life, I heard uh, Graham Hancock talk about continent-wide wildfires in North America during the Younger Dryas event. And it occurred to me that many thousand years ago, 12,000, 14,000 years ago, if there was a 
farmer who had given everything he had to love a woman who had brought children into the world and there was a continent-wide wildfire burning and it was threatening his home and his village and everything he had and the only thing he had to fight that fire was an elf handled farming implement i immediately caught an image of that and i thought what a wonderful thing it doesn't matter what's coming to tear down that family or that love that great man will give it his all to stop it anyway that's that's kind of what i have on the goddesses right now when i wrote um when i wrote about the goddesses and also true um, and i and i wrote another called love and hate and also true which uh, i will probably talk about loki about it next week and all of the poison that uh, the uninspired human intellect has thrust into this idea of our faith. Um, it's going to be a great challenge to deal with that and put these ideas of the divine feminine back up where they belong within our thought process when you have all kinds of individuals more than willing to boost their ego by denigrating the beauty of what we, are, we have the responsibility to hold is holy. So, having said that, I'm done talking about this one. Holy cow, we got a bunch of people. <laughs>